Now, I'm just going to ask somebody. I would just ask enough people. I don't care how many I had to ask. I would ask until somebody give it to me. Okay. So he said, look, what, what you, the banks the banks get that money from us. What we do, we just jump over that floor and get the people. We don't have no pride thing in the way here. The thing about people know we broke. We just simply ask the people. Don't go to the bank because they ain't got time for that. Because the banks get it from the people and then make you go through hoops to get it. Well, I'm teaching y'all something here. I'm telling you. They got $60 billion in the black community. And you run around trying to get an SBA loan? <laughs> y'all don't hear me. Nuggets in the crew. I just want my own family like Dr. Huxtable. Damn, they got him too. It's all in your mind, Q. Don't let it confuse you. Hope. Stay close to the people for the scraping. Taking me as a joke. Book of Rhymes, year one, you dig? Don't force them in your life, slow pace on your stripes, it's an uphill battle. Stick to the cold, don't switch up for them bad bitches. Remember you was on a mission, OG dropping law, you better listen. Life a classroom, you better pay attention. Everybody gonna start, but everybody ain't gonna finish. That's a boarded mission. That's why when you reach the top, it's a great feeling. I remember when I was low, I ain't got nowhere to go for a week and get no sleep. Alarm clock, I slept on the floor, so I stay woke. Jokingly, I read in between them lines. You was lying, but it's fine. You were dumb, but I'm focused. Yeah, so we Charlotte, North Carolina with it. Uh, this September the 3rd, the anniversary of Book of Rhymes. Book of Rhymes is a special project for me. Um, I actually created it, came up with the idea here in Charlotte. Um, you know, it was a nine month process for me to actually put everything together. I didn't even know you could create a book in nine months, but I did it. You know, it was just like I was on a very high frequency. Um, I just moved to Charlotte. If you read the alarm clock, you know, I talk about me losing my job in Columbus, Ohio. And then after I left Columbus, Ohio, I moved back to Winston. And me moving to Columbus, Ohio wasn't really a big move for me because I was only there for a short period of time. So when I got fired, I, I was going through a lot. I just lost my grandfather whose birthday is actually on today, September the 3rd. So I dedicated um, that date in honor of him. Also, nine plus three is 12, and you know that ties back into the alarm clock, 12 cycles. We got an interview set up for tonight um, with uh, a beautiful, uh, you know, host, Dr. Happy Hill. She's uh, very intellectual. Um, she's about to start her brand. You know, shout out to Coco. You know what I mean? Let's be real. That's the roots, you feel what I'm saying? So it's gonna be a wonderful project, production, you know what I'm saying? So check us out, yeah, Book of Rhymes, year one, you dig? All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of ZYN Network. I am your host, Happy Hill, and I just want you guys to help me in welcoming our guest speaker, who is Daryl Slade. Daryl Slade is the author of two books, The Alarm Clock and Book of Rhymes, and this is his one-year anniversary for his novel, Book of Rhymes. Daryl is also the owner of No More Suits, LLC. After graduating from Winston-Salem State University, Daryl went to work for Corporate America, but decided working for himself was more beneficial in the long run. Therefore, he started his own publishing company to help authors share their message with the world. Um, so, join me in welcoming Daryl Slade. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Of course. Um, so, first things first, let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, we know that you started off in corporate America, and how did this path influence you in wanting to become an entrepreneur? So, for as far as corporate, Mm -hmm. Well, I think I had the inspiration to become an entrepreneur before I was in corporate. Um, you know, just coming out of high school, I had a lot of eagerness. I had a lot of determination. I didn't really know what an entrepreneur was, but um, it sounded like a cool term. Um, but, you know, I was always independent growing up. So I knew going into college that I wanted to start my own enterprise. I just didn't know what exactly that would be and i felt as if when i went into college that i would kind of 
develop a definite plan on what my business would be and how I would become an entrepreneur. But as I was in college, I um, kind of got caught up in the whirlwind of corporate America. I was intrigued to go corporate and to learn about the corporate culture and um, learn their system so that I could perfect my system. So that's um, why I entered into corporate America, just to really kind of pick up on their corporate culture, pick up on how they um, ran their organizations and things like that. So when I did have my own business, I would have experience. Okay, awesome. So we learn in your book, The Alarm Clock, that while you were in high school, um, your mother passed away. And I wanted to know, how did this event propel you forward in your career? Um, Well, yeah, I I actually lost my mom right before I got into high school. I was 14 years old, um, and I lost her the February of 2009. I went to high school August of that year. And, you know, I think for any child going, making a transition from middle school to high school is, is huge. You know, it's already, you know, it's different, you know, especially for me going from a charter school to a public school. So that within itself was already hard, but then not having a mother to go home to um, just throughout the majority of my teen years was uh, definitely a challenge for me, but it also motivated me in the same sense. Like um, when I first lost my mom, I was lost, but it was also surreal. Like I wasn't emotional, I wasn't crying, I wasn't, you know, grieving all the time. I was just, um, I was just lost at heart but I didn't let that show because I had a lot of pride. So, um, but that, that kind of weighed heavy on my heart uh, because I didn't know how to be vulnerable. I didn't know how to express that pain. So it was it was tough for me and it reflected in the classroom. I was always, you know, getting in trouble. I was a knucklehead. I was getting involved with the wrong crowds and things like that, just to kind of adapt. Um, but then I think my freshman year, and I talk about this in a long like my freshman year, I actually heard my mother speak to me after she had passed, and um, I just felt her presence, and she was like, "It's more out here for you. Um, you know, you you know, you got a path. I didn't leave this earth for you to just, you know. I trusted that you would be all right. I trusted that you would do great things, but in order for you to do great things, you won't have to change certain things. So um, when I kind of felt that presence of her telling me that um it kind of gave me a spark um of inspiration um so I changed I switched my schools um it was actually with the the real reason why I switched schools is um you know and I ain't put this in the alarm clock it was Mm. a girl that I was interested in Uh Uh, I ain't gonna call her name out but she had went to Reagan and I was at North Forsyth and I had met her when I was at North Forsyth and I was mm-hmm. just really, that was like one of the first girls that I really was attracted to. And I was like, all right, let me let me, let me me go to this school because it, the school that she went to was mm-hmm. like real preppy, it was like majority, it was a PDI, PWI, however you say it. Um, and then I knew a lot of people that went there. So I was like, man, that, that kind of gave me uh, motivation to, to go there, but also in the same sense, I wanted to change. I wanted a new start. So um, that is what really changed my um, hope and gave me hope um, and gave me a new light. Uh, so Okay. Well, it sounds like you really made a big turnaround when you switched over to that school. Uh-huh. Um, what else would you say or did you have any other people that really influenced you or pushed you in the direction of what you have become today? Yeah, for sure. Um, m- uh, one of my f- uh, first, and I call his name out, uh, one of the first people who really changed my outlook on life was um, my homie. His name is Enoch Young. Uh, Enoch come from a good home, you know, both a father, you know, a father and a mother and strong father, strong mother, and he was really determined too. And he went to Reagan. So when I switched to schools, I was out of the district, but he drove, he had it. I thought that was really cool that he had his own car and that he had a license at 16. And so I had to carpool with him every day. And every day he was just, you know, he was heavy and, you know, he was a Christian. He was reading his word. He was talking about college. I think he was a senior at the time when I switched. It was my sophomore year. He was a senior. He was talking about going to college. 
he had a group of people who was, you know, thought positively, and I never really seen anything like that. Like, and it really encouraged me a lot. And every time I talk to him, I'm like, yo, bro, like, I appreciate you so much because I was lost. You know, I, I was lost. I didn't really care about college. I didn't care about, you know, no job. I didn't care about even starting my own business. I didn't, I was just lost. I, you know, whatever the world, you know, it was just whatever, I, you know, the world threw at me. But at the same time, that gave me like a definite, like, purpose. It gave me vision. It made me want more. And at the time, like, I was getting in a lot of trouble. My GPA was low. Um, so I had to put in a lot of work to get to where they was at. But that kind of, he kind of set the bar. Um, you know, he was, you know, he dressed nice. So I changed the way I was dressing and things like that. Mm -hmm. So he really had a huge impact on my life, you know what I'm saying, um, initially. So, yeah, shout out to E. I set my book like the yayo, I'm dropping pounds. Break it down, bag it up. These crack rocks keep on coming back like blue magic. My letter to his ill, it make you sick. They'll stop the truth. High off the light, city number two, can't even speak the truth. Uh. All right, so. Royce. <laughs> yeah. From that point, um, you graduated high school, moved on to college, graduated college, and then you set off to corporate America for what you thought would be the rest of your life. So um, tell us a little bit about your experience in corporate America and um, when you realized that that wasn't the path that you wanted to take. Well, I consciously knew because like when I, I started, me and um, another um, huge people who had a huge impact on my life was uh, one of my homies, uh, Chinamez Okoro, um, and me and him had connected. I just had to go back to answer your question. So like I connected with him my freshman year. So when I got into college, uh, at Winston Salem State, um, I connected. You know, my my the second semester of you know college, I told myself I wanted to get more involved, and so one of the things we did was uh, they had this you know uh, trip every year. I think Shalee um, Broussard put it on, um, and we went to uh, the Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro, and so I was like, that's an opportunity for me to connect with people, get out my comfort zone things like that. I wanted to get more involved, you know, with campus activities and stuff like that. Cause I was like, my freshman year, I was just like in a shell. The first part, I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't out, I wasn't talking to nobody. I was just, you know, hanging with my people from the Trey Folk. But the second semester I was like, I want to kind of, you know, get more involved and take advantage of this college opportunity. So that was one of the first things I did. And we went to the Civil Rights Museum and that's when I connected with, um, Kelsey, um, and he's from Nigeria, and he had a business called Ramp Connect, and he had told me about it. And mind you, I had already had on my conscience I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So he told me that, and he shared me with his, his vision, and we ended up becoming business partners, and we did a whole run, and I talk about the story in the alarm clock, you know, more detail. So I knew I wanted to, I already had that ambition to be, you know, a self-made hustler my freshman year, you know, in, prior to that. Um, so corporate came, you know, um, and I, I got to shout, you know, my man Antoine out, who's actually here tonight. Um, we, Antoine was uh, one of the founding members of the Student Investment Fund at Winston-Salem State. Um, and that was like a, a grant that was given to us. Uh, I ain't going to name the guy's name, but he donated money to the school for students to actually get involved with investing in the stock market. Um, and learn about how to invest and learn about the S&P 500 and learn about stocks and bonds and ETFs and things like that. And I didn't know what none of that was going into college. <laughs> but my dad um, knew Antoine because my dad worked at the university. And so my, my dad connected me with Twan. And, um, you know, Twan kind of took me under his wing. He was older than me. Um, so he was like a big brother to me. And so when I got involved with the fund, that's when I got introduced to um, for lack of a better word, um, the chick called Corporate America. So, um, <laughs> um, and I got, I was really intrigued by corporate, you know what I mean? You've seen these guys in these um, fancy suits mm -hmm. making a lot of money. Uh, we traveled to different conferences. We went to Dayton, Ohio. We went to New York. So that was like advertisement, <laughs> you feel me? So it was like, 
I got to get there. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is dope. Mm -hmm. And so, but I kind of like gave way of, you know, being a self-made, you know, entrepreneur. And I'm like, I want to go corporate. Like I got to do corporate, you know what I mean? Because it's like, they already got everything set up. I can come out of school making a hundred thousand. I can come out, you know what I'm saying? With a nice job, nice car, you know, everything that come with that. So that's what really intrigued me to go to go corporate, but in the same sense, like I always had a lot of passion for my community in the city of Winston-Salem. And I understood that it wasn't a lot of people in corporate America that looked like me. And so I wanted to kind of break that barrier to pave ways for people who came out to me to get opportunities in corporate America too. Um, so that was like, you know, the real sense behind it. But at the same time, it was like a desire to like, be like these people who like the Wolf of Wall Street or whatnot. So. That's how I got into corporate, but I always knew that I didn't want to be there long term. I knew I, I, I was going to get in and get out at some point. I didn't know it was going to be as quick as I did, but that was always on my subconscious. Okay, so going into your next step, um, starting your publishing company and writing The Alarm Clock, um, can you talk to us about the procedure and the steps that you took to starting your publishing company coming out of corporate america and starting your first book the alarm clock yeah so i had started the alarm clock so going back to my homie kelsey um martina mezzo who i talked about earlier um kelsey had wrote a book um called dichotomy um his my i mean it was like my sophomore year junior year i can't remember um, you know, he he's just, you know, he got a lot of ambition. He, he got a lot of projects, a lot of things that he was doing. And so he had told me, and he, we got the same mindset too. So like uh, he he told me my junior year, I want to say, I was, I remember I was like in Birmingham, Alabama for a convention for Alpha. And Kelsey had reached out to me and he was like, yo, he had it simultaneously. Um, he had his first book signed in that that same night, so he was like, "Bro, I sold all my books out." He was like, "I made a grip," and then like you know they had you know they had the African culture. Mm-hmm. He had all these people. I see. I'm like, man, that's dope. He had like artists out, mm-hmm. and he was like, "Bro, if I can do this, you know, you you could do it." Like he was like, "You need to write a book," and I'm like, "Man, no, I'm not about to write no book. No, <laughs> like without." Like, I, I'm like, I don't got nothing to talk about. Yeah. But see, me and him had so many conversations. He was like, bro, you got a different mindset that somebody need to hear. And I was like, bro, I'm not writing a book. <laughs> and, like, I literally was opposed to it. I'm like, I don't, I didn't, it was like a fear almost. I'm like, I'm not, I don't, I didn't, and I felt like I wasn't worthy of writing no, no book. So, um, he was like, bro, just write 30 minutes a day. I was like, all right, I could do that. So literally January of 2016, I started writing the alarm clock. I started scripting it out, and I started out. I, um, I was talking about uh, the the chapter. Uh, I think it's the Promised Land. The original name of it was gonna be the Power of Circumcision, and um, I had just started writing about how you gotta cut things out in order to grow, cut things out your life in order to grow. And so that's that's literally what I first started writing because I understood that. And then the essence of moving in silence came from like that. I didn't have the title when I first started writing, but I just, the, the tone of that came from, um, you know, me being in college and me knowing what I wanted to do. And uh, while I was in college, nobody knew my determination. I was just kind of like slayed the clown. You know what I mean? It was like the essence of moving in silence. Mm-hmm. Like I know why I'm here. But I'm not going to tell you why I'm here. I'm just here for a definite purpose. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, that's where the essence of silence, you know, moving in silence came from. So, long story short, I um, started writing it. But, you know, with time, you know, and life, I just kind of put it to the side. Um, And when I didn't know when I wanted to release I said I was going to release it when I graduated from college. But that didn't happen because I went corporate. You know, I got a corporate job and things like that. And, and I don't want to go into detail on the alarm clock, but um, I got fired from my job. I was there for three weeks, and I got fired. But I had so much desire build up in me. I'm like, I, I don't – when I was there, ironically, it, it motivated me more to become an entrepreneur. So I was like, I got to get I gotta get the hell out of here. And that language, my body language showed that. You know, I was just – 
cocky and arrogant. Not like not not deliberately, but it was mm-hmm. just like, you know, like I knew it was more out here for me. Right. You know, and I was the only black guy in the office and every time I walk in they looking like I stole the baby milk. <laughs> you know, so but, but I was like I I I got I got I was something more it was something like tugging at me. And um I guess that I call it confidence. That confidence just showed so much that they was like well, you you know, this you're not fit for this description. I don't think they meant it in a bad I don't know, but to me I told them thank you when they when they fired me. I was like, I appreciate y'all. It wasn't like, oh, boo hoo. It was like, it hurt. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm like, you know, pride. But at the same time, I'm like, thank you. And I told myself when I came back, I was like, I'm gonna help my pops out. I'm gonna help him grow his business. I'm gonna finish the alarm clock. I was like, by December of 2017, the alarm clock is gonna be out. And so in that, I had so much energy Realmed up, I feel like it was like divine almost because like if that didn't happen, chapter eight, nine, ten would not have been written. Um, if it had not me being fired, so it was it completed the book. You know what I'm saying? It completed that cycle of the clock because like I said, it's twelve chapters, so it completed that twelfth hour. So um, in that, um, I, I, I discovered, you know, my talent for writing I discovered my talent for poetry and my mentor had told me when uh when I had came back at fire because I was working with him before I went to Columbus Ohio at Morgan mm-hmm. Stanley and he was like bro you know people people get energy from you wearing your blue suit your brown suit if anybody who knew me from college you know they knew I was always suited and booted I always had a suit on like every day because I was just strictly business you know what I mean I'm going to business meetings and that's I was very professional so um my mentor saw that and he was like you know he really had he took me under his wing and um he was like bro you know people get so much energy from you wearing your suit but I knew at that same time I'm like that suit don't define who I am it's just an illusion. And it motivated me to write the poem. This was in August of 2017. I had just got back from Ohio, and I was working on the alarm clock. But after that phone conversation, it literally motivated me to write this poem called No More Suits. And I done spoke it before. I did it before. I perform it all the time. It's in Book of Rhymes. But so the spark of No More Suits was actually a poem. But they overlooking me. I guess I'm speaking in codes. I feel for the homeless. They without food, but they got the most fruit. I'm speaking loud, but I'm on mute. Cause you ain't got your blue suit. You not in corporate office, so you a failure. You came back to the bottom, cause it's hell here. And when Jesus went to hell, was he walking on earth? Face the evils of the people. Jesus never wore suits. He spoke the truth. Might have seen them kids in the street, not enough to eat. Salaries not helping the people in need, so. They need me, food for thought. I'm planting seeds in concrete, hoping people see. I'm hoping they read what's written in the trees. No more suits, no more ties. Just speaking that truth till I die. My hoodie, I'm mellow, but I'm mellow. Hello, yeah. Um, you know, down the line. Um, as I was working on Booker Rhymes, I started learning about entities. I started learning about corporations, how to how to legally set up your own business. And so as I was working on that, this was like fast forward. The alarm clock had got out. I was working on Booker Rhymes, and I was like, okay, I need to protect my assets. Let's backtrack a little bit before we get on Booker Rhymes. Um, there was something that you said about leaving corporate America and how when they fired you, it was liberating. Um, you also talk about having a slavery mindset. What from your book, The Alarm Clock, would you say specifically could help somebody free themselves from modern slave mentality? Because not just anybody could leave corporate America and be okay and just ready to be, you know, jump into entrepreneurship. So what can we take away from your book to help people free their mind? Yeah, so I, I got... Um I know you said you don't want to jump in Booker Rhymes yet, but I'm going to take this line out of Booker Rhymes. I was like, um, 
Um, I, it's just, just, I'm going to just say two lines from it. It says, uh, I, was, I wasn't a slave to the white man. I was a slave to my own thoughts. And um, when you look at slavery, it's like uh, you look at the power of your mind. You know, you can mentally be in bondage. And in Chapter 3 in Emancipation Proclamation, the way I opened it up, I was like, I was like, the chains aren't metal no more. They mental. And so it's literally a mentality. You know, um, if you want to keep yourself in a box, you, you know, um, it's a poem out there that says, if you think you beat and you are, if you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win and think you can, it's almost a sense you won't. So it's like, it's all in your mind. Um, so if you want to be free, you have to free your mind um, because your mind is so powerful and the power of your thoughts determine on if that thought is going to be manifested or not. You know, you think about, you know, you think about a child. I, in, in, in the alarm clock, I talk about my mother. Um, they told my mom that she was never supposed to have a kid again. They said that, you know, it was it was impossible. Like, you can't have no kid. But she was at a show in Atlanta, and she seen a slim, dark, uh, you know, tender dude that looked like how I'm built. <laughs> and she told my father, that's my son right there. That's him. You know, and my father looked at her like she was crazy. But she was like, no, that's him. He's That's him. I'm going to have this kid. And she thought me into existence. You know what I'm saying? Three years later, I was born. And so you look at the power of thought. The words, like in the Bible, it say the words became flesh. So, you know, for anybody who wants to uh, follow their heart, I say get your mind right first. Free your mind first. Don't put any limit on your thought, whether it's financial, whether it's your family, whether it's marriage, whether it's a relationship, whatever it may be that's holding you back. Don't put no limit on your on your life because you're you're born into this universe. So that means you're born into greatness. You you you're called. You're chosen. So don't let nothing limit you. It's literally you know, you're you're the only one that can limit yourself. But when it comes to entrepreneur, I don't want to recommend anybody being like how I did and taking a big jump off the deep end. Like have some capital. You know, invest. Um, have mentors, have attorneys, have um, accountants, have bookkeepers to make sure that you're doing everything feasible, you know, and you're making sure that the decision that you're making isn't insane. Like, you know, I made a lot of dumb decisions, you know, but capital is key. You, you know, America has capital in Washington, D.C., so <laughs> you have to have capital as well. And uh, intellectual capital is uh, um, the most profound I should say okay yeah well I'm sure it took a lot of faith to do what you're doing now um, and faith seems to also be like a reoccurring theme that you talk about in uh, the alarm clock so how would you say your spiritual beliefs have influenced you throughout your career as an artist yeah um, I think that uh, you know uh, I I I got involved. I, my, my, I grew up in a Christian church, um, and I, you know, as a kid, you know, you just that's just what you exposed to. It's like you know, it's the norm. So it's like you know, it's like eating cereal. You just used to eating the cereal, um, but when you're on your own, you kind of learn it for yourself. So I really learned Christianity after my mom died, and it really started to speak to me, um, like the power of faith the power of wisdom, um, the power of, you know, willpower, all of these things that was in this Christian religion that kind of gave me hope um, and, you know, desire. And then, like, certain stories in the Bible, like the story of Joseph, the story of Moses, you know, the story of Paul, all of that stuff, like, really intrigued me. And it kind of, you know, helped me really understand my vision a lot more and it brought me a lot of peace in the dark times in my life. And um, I say in the alarm clock, I was like, if you never been through nothing, those words won't mean anything to you. Um, so they really hit the um, ball on the head. So um, yeah, like that was really my, that's how I, I think I, how I developed my spirituality in a sense, because I'm not subscribed to any um, religion, but it was like a catalyst to um, help me better understand myself, if you will. 
Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so another question on faith. Do you think faith and sacrifice go hand in hand? And also, how do you think those two concepts work together um, to become successful as an entrepreneur? Yeah, um, you have to have faith. I mean, we you have faith every morning. Like, you know, you don't know if you defeat, you know, the, the ground that you put your feet on is going to collapse. So that's a subconscious faith. Um, but I think you, you definitely have to have faith out here and you definitely have to make sacrifices. Um, I'll tell you a story, you know, when I, when I released Book of Rhymes, when I first uh, released it last year, um, I had to sell my bed, um, in order to get the copies for Book of Rhymes. So literally the liquidity that I got from selling my bed, I, I slept on the floor for four months. Um, Twan, my witness, he, my, he was my roommate, you know, so like uh, I, I literally slept on the floor. I slept with my words, you know, um, so that's like the ultimate faith. And like I didn't even know, like, and, and I probably gave away more books than I actually sold um, because I, I, it's not about the dollar for me. It's about the actual words. It's about the the the, the vision, you know. And and I look at Book of Rhymes like it's gonna be around for centuries. It's gonna be around for generations to come. So it's like it's worth that sacrifice. It's worth having the faith. And so yes, they are a, a perfect marriage. Faith and discipline and sacrifice. They all are like the holy trinity. Hope I don't get in any trouble for saying that from the religious <laughs> book. <laughs> All righty. So another thing that I wanted to touch on was in chapter three, you talked about having the masters of your masters. And it seems like with your publishing company, you are the master of your masters. So can we dive deeper into this quote and really dissect it and talk about the importance of having ownership of your own products? Yeah, for sure. Um, like, so the purpose of me doing that, like, I'm, I'm the type of writer, I put stuff in the in a book to make somebody mad. I want people to get mad because I, I like to have the dialogue. Um, so, like, that was a controversial statement from Jay-Z in 444. He was talking about Prince. He said, this guy had slave on his face. You know, you think he wanted the masters with his masters because Prince didn't own his masters because we didn't have anybody to educate us to say, Yo, you need to own your work. You 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 know these these people are taking advantage of your value. You know you, you know I think our words are powerful, and you know they it's like um, it's important for us to understand that concept because like if you don't have education, somebody can easily come in and take advantage of you. It's been happening for years. So with my company, no more suits. I make sure. I make sure before the artist tells me their story, I, I, I make sure that they, like, look, you have to own your copyrights. You know what I mean? We we do that for you. We make sure that this is something that's protected for you because your book is going to manifest throughout years. That's a royalty, you know, and you're a king, you're a queen. You have to have your royalties, you know, to be passed down for generations for your kids and your kids' kids. Not only will it develop like generational wealth, but that's generational lineage. You know, like I have my my biological grandfather, like he has kids who I don't even know. I got aunties and uncles that I don't even know. So like not only is this story being protected and being preserved, but it's also developing generational wealth, but you have to have the control over that asset in order to do that. Um, and to protect that and to make sure that it's, you know, legit. So um, I think that, and that's so, that goes for so much, you know, it, it, we'll be talking about it all night. But um, that's why, you know, in, in, in layman terms, that's why I put that in there, just to have dialogue, you know, not necessarily with me, but whoever the reader is and, you know, book club or anything, it's, it's, it's really open-ended for the, for the reader to really kind of dissect what that means. And then I, I, I specifically put it in there right after, I mean, I, I opened that, you know, that the paragraph up saying, you know, 
the mentality is, you know, slavery is a mentality. Like Abraham Lincoln did not free the slaves. Like, like you, he, it, it couldn't, he couldn't have if, you know, some people still are, you know, still have a slave mentality to this day. You know, you talk about Willie Lynch. That was like a propaganda. Like, oh, you're free. Mm -hmm. But still you're in bondage with your mind and the resources and the food that you eat and the music that you listen to and the stuff that you're exposed to and the the divide that you have within your own race. You know what I mean? The black on black crime. You're a slave to that. You're a slave to your environment, you know, and it's literally all mental and it, it just takes time because this has just been a disease that's been occurring over multiple generations so that's kind of the point that i was trying to get across with emancipation proclamation we emancipate our own minds we don't have to rely on the abraham lincoln you know to emancipate us period you know when i came down here to charlotte like i mean you know it's just i think the my first element is survival you gotta you gotta learn how to survive you gotta adapt and like if you chasing your desires, if you're chasing your heart, you're chasing your dream, you know, I know for me, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't know I was going to have a company called No More Soups. I had wrote the poem No More Soups before I moved to Charlotte, but I didn't know it was going to be a publishing company. But when I came down here, I was just following my heart. I just knew I wanted to do more. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I always knew I wanted to invest in myself, I always knew I wanted to give back to my culture, give back to my community. Um, I always knew that I wanted to be an impression for somebody um, who had a similar background outcome as I did. Broke the code, I'm not a hoe, you see, that's the standard, I talk too much, they can't stand it. Los, no more cold nights, at this point I can't fold ten toes, I'm solid like a backbone. Army strong, real big like Christopher Wallace, young self-made legends, that's what your girl called us. Well, I just love how there's so much passion in the way that you speak about your book and these quotes. Um, what would you say really fuels you as a writer? Um, Like, I don't write to an audience, I write for myself. Like, it's like, um, the audience is gonna get the message later. Like, I got tons of poems that I haven't even released. I got tons of passages that I haven't even released. It's just like things that internal pain that I'm dealing with that's the only way I know how to express myself. Um, now that I learned the, the, you know, that I have this gift of writing, it's almost like um, you know it's a remedy for me, you know what I mean? If I don't have any other escape, you know my word is my bond and that's all I got so um, that's, that's my cure so you know um that's that's why i write and um you know also it's just like you know it, it's it's like a hobby for me you know what i mean if i'm not dealing with any type of pain it's a hobby i, I can really get creative with with my writing style and things like that so i enjoy it you know okay so i would say just from going through the alarm clock that book is really enlightening but then when you go over to book of rhymes it seems like that's more of like a personal journey for you like through the struggle and your everyday challenges so what were your motivations between the two books so um for Book of Rhymes, um, I had um, been writing poetry um, when I had moved to Charlotte. Uh, I moved to Charlotte, you know, um, Twan, I got to call him out again. You know, he, Twan had, a, you know, he had already been living in Charlotte. He had his foundation, you know, he was living with my line, he's my line brother, and he was living with my other line brother, and he was like, bro, you got to, he understood what I was going through. He understood I had just got fired from my job and I was about to, you know, do, you know, alarm clock and all that. He was like, bro, you need to get out of Winston. Like, you want to move to Charlotte? We about to get a three bedroom. You have your own space and all that. I was like, I had no question. I was like, hell yeah, you know? And, um, you know, I came down and, 
you know, I had my own space, like, really to kind of clear my thoughts. And I had my, um, you know, it was like my own tabernacle. Like, you know, I I owe that room so much, you know, I wish I could go back to it and make it a museum because it was like just so many moments was, you know, it, it sparked the the creation of Book of Rhymes. It sparked, I, I literally remember the day that, you know, I first seen the alarm clock, you know, it was like right after the Jay-Z concert that next morning and it was just like, ironically, I was on the phone with Kelsey when the UPS truck came uh, and Kelsey was the one who inspired the book and I ain't know the UPS truck was about to come. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it, it, it's just like, I just had to thank the people around me, honestly, you know what I mean? Cause that, you know, if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for Twine, you know, reaching out to me, I don't know what I would have did if I would have been stuck in Winston and you know, think my path would have changed so much, you know? And I, like I said, when I released the alarm clock, ironically, I released it December 12th, 2017. I didn't know that I was going to have a second book. I remember me and Coco, she asked me, she was like, are we going to have an alarm clock part two? <laughs> and that was January the 11th of 2018 when we had our first interview. Um, shout out to Coco. You know, she's behind the camera. Um, and I was like, no, I, I didn't. It wasn't thought of. But, but literally right after that interview, like, I had all these poems. And I had a friend of mine who was like, you know, who was reading my poems and was like, yo, this is dope. And that inspired me to kind of put together this book of rhymes. So, and it kind of developed over that nine month process. So that's to, you know, and simple, you know, to keep it short, that's that's what it inspired. It's just the people around me, honestly. You know, I had a lot of great people around me to really kind of, you know, whether they realize it or not, you know, they have a huge part of, you know, this process of, of these, you know, these novels. Okay. Um, so in Book of Rhymes, there is a segment in the book called Holy Grail, The Temptation to Quit, Struggles of Journeying Alone. Can you really walk us through um, this time period of your life and um, how it helped you develop the person that you are today yeah um yeah so holy grail like i wrote that like literally i wrote that on my way driving from winston to charlotte my first night moving down there and um it was like i had so much determination but i was really going through a lot so it was like a balance um so in that poem I was just like man like I'm about to start my new life um but at the same time it's like so like I was I literally had two hundred dollars to my name I didn't know where my next stream of income was gonna come from and all of that I just knew I was moving forward and they say you know with a snake like people always say snakes are bad like you know stay away from snakes but like I learned like what a snake what it does when it sheds its skin it isolates itself and it goes to like a hard rocky area so that it can cut through the old skin in order for the new skin to grow and i think that that's kind of where i that kind of speaks to where i was at like i had to isolate myself and i had you know it's painful to cut off that old skin but the new skin was simultaneously growing and so that's what really what holy grail was really talking about and i gotta you know I think I think it ends like my book is like the yeah yo I'm dropping pounds break it down back it up these crack rocks keep them coming back like blue magic my literature is ill it make you sick don't start the truth straight pure these for my addicts city number two I was talking about Charlotte I came to speak the truth so what that was saying to break that line down I was saying like my book is like the yeah yo the alarm clock is like pure cocaine you know it it'd take you longer to to get that high. You had to actually read through the paragraphs. But I was like, break it down, bag it up. These crack rocks, that's poetry. So it was like, now I'm taking a whole paragraph or a whole chapter and I'm putting it into, you're gonna get a quicker high off of one little line. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, like uh, I was like, my words like HIV, you don't 
know you've been hit. Mm. <laughs> Slow murder, like eat the F dime truck. I ain't feeling him either. You know what I'm saying? So like that could literally I could write a whole paragraph on that, that those three lines. And so um that's that uh, that's the ending of Holy Grail. But that was me saying, All right, city number two, I came to speak the truth. I'm in Charlotte now. I came to speak the truth. I got a new motivation. This is people read Book of Rhymes and A C Babylon and stuff like that. I'm talking about Charlotte Charlotte. So yeah, that's 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 what that Holy Grail is about. Okay. I love I just love how you just put that together. Like I must say like the whole thing just flowed. <laughs> like I don't know if you were practicing, no, but I- <laughs> that sounded really great. Um, so another thing that you talk about, and I think this really ties in with your brand of No More Suits LLC, um, you talked about shiny things being blinding. Um, so besides, apart from wearing a suit, can you describe how that just plays into everyday life? Like the people that you meet, the cards you see, et cetera, et cetera. How could shiny things be blinding in? How could you move away from that and really find the truth in situations? I think that, like, they say humans are masters of illusions. So it's like, um, it's, and I ain't no philosopher. I ain't, like Meek say, I ain't come here to preach. But it's just what I observe. Like, somebody would rather chase a title than chase their destiny, you know, because of, the role that it takes, and it kind of t- goes back into you know, you know, I talk about myself. I don't want to call no, I don't want to talk about anybody else. I use myself, like when I wanted to get into corporate America, it was shiny, it was security. You know, I would have been coming out making you know good money from Winston Salem to Trey Fo. If you come out making a hundred thousand dollars, you looked at like a god, you know, and so that comes with pride. You know, people lust for pride. That boss life quote-unquote um it's it's simple i mean i mean it's not simple because you got to work to get there you know what i mean but like if you don't have no purpose like some people is literally they give up their purpose so going back to sacrifice some people will sacrifice their purpose in order to chase a title and in return like i say like morgan stanley is still gonna be morgan stanley a hundred years from now you know but if I was working for no more San, Stan, Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley would be that what it is, but it wouldn't be a no more suits. And I explain in the book they, that they literally, you, you can't start your own business if you're working for a fiduciary institution because it's a conflict of interest. So now you're in bond. That goes back to slavery. You know, you're in bondage to Morgan Stanley. So you can't even set up a legacy for your family. Wait, you A 401k that might get... You know, that there's so many risks with that. You know, you, you can't rely on Social Security. You know, so it's like when you when you come out of if, unless you really have a financial plan, you know, it, it, it's it's hard to leave a legacy behind like that. You know what I mean? You you leaving somebody else's legacy behind. You know, they they get the bigger end of the stick in a sense because they get in your time, that you know, your efforts, things like that. So like you you look at the shiny you got to kind of peel back those those shiny things and look at what's real you know and like Jay say I wanna I don't want to be a trend I want to be the Rav Lauren you know want to be around for forever we play for forever period. Away from hell, it says on my pole too hot up all night like the city that never sleeps born again I'm the new Rod Kim ain't feeling Eric B my rhymes make you woke like coke on the mic but they take me as a joke. I guess I'm a comedian. Outside of saying he don't deserve the city. Speaking in codes like Hebrew, the people who understood is only a select few. My mind is shape of a pyramid because it's going. Spilling gold like the bay in the late 18s. They're both really, really good, but motivational, that alarm clock, like, it is really good. Y'all should really, like, check him out. And we'll talk about, like, where to find his um, things, like his website and social media. So y'all should look into them. Support black business. <laughs> what, was your, uh, what was your network? Um, it acronym. is called, it's ZYN. So I've been bouncing back and forth. I felt for the sake of the podcast, 
ZYN Network sounded the best. Um, but it's called a, it's called Zion. Um, we dedicate ourselves to educating the community on agriculture, sustainability, and holistic alternatives of health. Um, so that holistic health really has an umbrella, and I think that Daryl really fits under there um, because I really want to help people enhance their mind, body, and soul. And I feel like with this book, The Alarm Clock, as far as like motivation and really like enhancing like your mind, like freeing your mind from that slavery mindset and really shifting into like that free mindset, like it really helps. So he really fits under that umbrella of holistic health. Um, but to answer your question, as far as the acronym, um, the N stands for network. Um, so with the network, it's going to be the interviews. Um, and I have some other plans that I will make sure I get everybody's information so I can invite you guys to um, future events that I will be hosting. Um, <clears throat> the Y stands for youth. Um, that's my nonprofit. Um, so that is the Zion Foundation, and that's where we really go out to schools and teach them about like agriculture, sustainability, um, and really helping us shift gears towards just like building a better future for our planet. Because everybody can see like our world is like in chaos. So I think it's important to really start um, with the kids because they're the future for tomorrow. And the Z, um, I don't talk about that too much, but the word Zion or Zion, um, what it means is a weapon and it also means return to light. Um, so my interpretation of that was that your spirituality, like when you're enlightened, that's like a weapon, like in the Bible, how it says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Like I look at your spirit and your soul as like a bigger weapon than any, any gun, any, any physical manifestation, any physical material item that they have out here. Like your spirituality is the biggest weapon and let's not forget that. So Zion is really going to just move people forward, enlighten them. And as a collective, like we're really going to become that weapon against I don't want to say the system to get like, you know, into conspiracies, but just like becoming a weapon and going away from this plan that they have um, for our planet and really just living in a world where we're really tapping into that super conscious. So those are my goals with my company. So. And we are back with Daryl Slade on part two of our interview. Um, just gonna continue to dive deeper into our book. Once again, it is his one year anniversary for his <clears throat> book of rhymes. Um, so we are so excited to have him on today as we go through this journey of entrepreneurship. Um, so speaking of entrepreneurship, can you talk about the importance of black entrepreneurship and black enterprise in the political climate and everything that's going on right now? Yeah, um, I'll speak brief on it. Um, I think that it's important for the youth to understand the uh, essence of entrepreneurship, un understand the um, verbiage of financial literacy, um, whether they go to college or not, um, because it's a necessity, uh, excuse me, a necessity to survival. I think it's a, a survival element to financial literacy because you can't survive without your finances and it's important to know how to invest, what to invest in, how to protect yourself, um, different tax brackets, how to um, segregate different assets, uh, how to get into real estate, how to build capital, all of that great stuff. Um, uh, and like I, I think we mentioned it earlier, having a good attorney, um, you know, good mentors. And your mentors should, I believe, consist of somebody that's doing the business that you're doing um, a good attorney, a good accountant, um, and also somebody who is very uh, inspirational as well. Um, so yes, entrepreneur is de definitely very important because of the system that we live in. Um, they don't provide too many opportunities for our people. And the gateway of interest, um, well, the, the barriers are very high um, to going to get a good job. Um, so it's important for you to have like a 
generator of wealth. That, like that's dope. Uh, generator of wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, uh, so something you can fall back on um, in hard times. So definitely um, very important, and it's important to learn at a young age. You know, you can really learn the fundamentals of business. You know, from five, five years old to you know, 70, 80 years old. I look at myself like a five-year-old when it comes to knowledge. So, yeah, I'm in kindergarten all over again. Mm-hmm. I know nothing. So at the point that you're at right now, how would you define wealth, and what does being wealthy look like for you? Um, simply put, I think that um, it's how long you can survive um, without a paycheck. Um, I think that's what determines your wealth and, um, in simple terms, you know, um, being able to have passive income, um, that can surmount your, um, expenses. So like if you have cash flow of $4,000 coming in from where you not, you're not actively going to work for this $4,000, but it's coming in every month and your expenses is like two grand. I think that's the basics of, uh, you know, financial literacy and being able to not only um, buy your freedom, but also buy your time. And it's, it's really simply complicated. You know, I think people make it complicated, but there's so many ways like, you know, uh, I listen to uh, Rich Dad Radio um, with Robert Kiyosagi and you know he he has a book out called Fake and he's talking about fake money fake assets you know because the dollar isn't backed by anything um, they took the dollar off of the gold standard I think in 1971 and you know you could check me on that I always tell people don't believe anything I say look it up for yourself uh, just as a disclosure but um, you know money you know paper assets aren't real um so it's important to understand what real assets are when it comes to financial literacy whether it's real estate whether it's gold whether it's silver whether it's uh rare elements you know and learning how to protect that and preserve it for a long time like in the form of a a trust or a llc or a limited partnership and things like that so nobody can take that asset away from you and that kind of ties back into what we were talking about with the intellectual property at the beginning of the interview um i kind of forgot what the question was but i hopefully that answered it yeah um so that was just on the topic of wealth Mm -hmm. and what wealthy looks for you and i think you answered that perfectly so thank you so much for that no problem um so Moving back to your book of rhymes, um, of course, I got to touch on this one. There was a um, segment that you had that was called Underground Railroad, The Road to Zion. So can we talk about that a little bit and um, sure. what that means to you, the significance of that one? Sure. So, you know, um, Book of Rhymes is uh, I open it up with a slave narrative because if you want to like if I want to uh, paint a picture for you, so it's like. I looked at myself like being on a plantation. And um, when you're on a plantation, you better not leave Massa. You know what I'm saying? Because Massa going to whip you. Massa going to kill you. Um, so, therefore, it's fear to leave. You know, and that's why a lot of people didn't, you know, they said Harriet Tubman says a quote, and I could be quoting it wrong, but she said she would have freed a lot more slaves had they known that they were slaves. Um, just because people are so equipped to, are uh, nurtured to fear. So um, with that, um, you know, you have to, um, with Book of Rhymes is like the, 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 the story or the narrative is somebody breaking loose out of, off of a plantation and, um, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, the the whole narrative is me getting off a of plantation, going through the Underground Railroad. Um, that's like uh, getting out of a secure, secure system, if you will, and going to Zion, you know, and Zion is like, so if you read the book, like in the beginning of Book of Rhymes, most of the po- poems are dark. 
they're hardcore, it's, it's rough, you know. But then as you ease your way through the Underground Railroad, I encounter so many different people also having their, um, I think it's called The Village, uh, where I met so many people along this Underground Railroad, you know, um, my escape from the plantation. Um, and I met people who I wouldn't have met had I stayed on the plantation um, for, you know, as, you know, just for the, the terms of, you know, in the book. And then I go to a higher level of spirituality, um, which I believe is Zion. And I have a page that's dedicated. I said, Zion is in your mind. Um, it's your highest level, of, you know, for me, it was my highest level of spirituality where, you know, I, I uh, started to connect with my mother more on a spiritual level. Um, so I opened up more about her. I start, you know, God rest my grandfather's soul. You know, he, um, today's his birthday. And that's another reason why I dedicated the September 3rd for the release of Book of Rhymes. Um, I connected with him and I started understanding like, um, you know, um, metaphysics and how they live through me, you know, through my words and um, how that energy is still alive through me. And so it was like I connected to, on a, you know, a heavenly path. You know, you go, um, I've been studying ancient Kemet and you you look at the 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 Sphinx, and I talk about it in there, it's like uh, the Sphinx is was in Giza. It's called the Haru Amaketi. That's the proper name um, for it. And it means that you master your animal d domain to reach your highest level of spirituality or your highest level of priesthood. Um, at least that's how I interpret it for, for me. And it's like, you know, this. they say we live in an animal kingdom. You know, we killing each other. We fighting each other. We it's like the Hunger Games. But if you can navigate through that and reach a higher level and higher dimension, you know, I think that's, that's you. I don't think anybody can master life, but I think that's a beautiful thing to where you can navigate in the right now and still connect in the future and the past all at once, to say the least. I know I'm rambling, but no. that's that's kind of what what that means. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, Book of Rhymes really meant a lot to me, you know. Um, I, I, I got a lot of divine messages through there. And like I said, I think it's a message, of course, for the right now, but I think I was writing for the future, um, you know, Tom. I think it's going to make a lot more sense to, you know, like our kids, 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 children. With no more suits, I like to think outside the box. So, like... This is literally page three in Book of Rhymes. I feel like this is culture, you know, where you can take a book and put it onto a shirt, put it onto a hat, put it onto some joggers, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like thinking outside the box. I don't, I don't want to limit, you know, publishing to just writing, you know what I mean? So it's like with page three, you know what I mean? It's just literally page three and, and book of rhymes you know what i mean so it's just like it's marketing it's marketing it's like i feel like this one of my best projects you know what i mean so like when i was doing it when i was working on shirt designs and things like that shout out to nala designs uh when i was working on shirt designs like literally it just came to me like a lightning strike like i was getting ready to close my computer and i was like Damn, because I remember putting this together. I like literally created, formatted this whole book. I'm like, yo, Slim, this shit would look nice on a t-shirt. So like, um, I went back to the computer, mocked it up, and I, was, I sent it to uh, the people who work on my shirts. And I was like, I, I gotta get this. I came up with it like back in like, I say like March, April. So like, um, we just released it. I feel like it was a perfect time to release it around the year anniversary of uh, Book of Rhymes. So yeah, that's that's page three. Go get that. No more suits LLC.com slash bookstore. You did. Haven't wrote poetry in a while, been in them trenches, still Gloria Carter. I smile. Living in them shadows, they happy but not free. Oh be sovereignty coded language, you see? It's the unforeseen.
You talked about your influences, um, some of your influences being um, people in your childhood. You have some quotes from Jay-Z, but Book of Rhymes is dedicated to Nas. Um, so let's talk about how Nas has influenced you um, on this journey and um, also how we plan on getting this book to Nas. Well, I don't know if this is true, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I take people for their word. Mm -hmm. And I got word that um, this is going to be on record mm -hmm. for, on your show. That, uh, Nas actually has Book of Rhymes in his possession. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and it's a very trusted brother who, who told me that. So, um, Book of Rhymes is officially in, in, in uh, Nas's hands and well in his possession. And um, from what I were, we just gonna go with it. <laughs> and uh, I had a, a vision uh, that Nas would get the book, and you know, in in Book of Rhymes, uh, there's a passage somewhere in those pages where it's called Letter to Nas. And uh, I told him, I was like, I had a vision of you getting this book. And I was like, so I felt like it would be dope for me to write you a letter because, you know, I, my, I, I, I got introduced to Nas through my sister. My sister was a big Nasir fan, and I got turned on through, to him through that. And as I listened to his music, it was just so much culture. You know, it's like Nas is the type of lyricist to where he could tell you a story and it's like you watching a movie and i thought that was really dope and then like um we had a lot of parallels to him losing his mother uh to you know all of the things that he kind of well, i'm not saying our past was similar but it was a lot of his last name is jones my mother's last name is jones i'm a jones blood so it was just a lot of connections with nas i'm just a big fan of nas i'm a big fan of hip-hop and i feel nas is in my top two you know, uh, for me, I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but for me, Nas is in my top two. And actually, um, Nas has a song called Book of Rhymes, which inspired the title. Um, and that's one of one of my favorite tracks. It's like, you know, it was a bunch of poems that he had, like he said, as that, as that song opened. It's like he found these poems in boxes and shit. He was like, that was like, yo... He, it was on his uh, Lost Tapes. It was on the first. He just released Lost Tapes, too. So on the first Lost Tapes, he dropped, I think, it, no, excuse me, that's on Godson, Book of Rhymes. Yo, this can't be my Book of Rhymes, you know. And so that's what inspired the title. You know, I just, uh, a lot of homage to Nas, you know. I look at him like a priest for our culture, for our people, you know, and uh, to say the least. But, yeah, so I'm... I'm I was humbled to to have got gotten that news, you know, and so yeah, this, uh, you know, I had to had to dedicate it to Escobar, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That is really great news to hear that this book has actually traveled into Nas's hand, and that just goes back to talking about what we've covered, like the power of thought, the power of manifestation, elevating your mind and freeing your mind from the slave mindset of what you see and putting faith into what you want to be. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this last uh, topic. Um, you talked about going from slaves to gods, um, backtracking to um, the slavery thing, but how can we get from point A to point B, from being a slave to being a god? And what does it mean to you um, to become a god? Oh, that's a really deep question. <laughs> I don't know if that's a question for me, but um, really what slaves to gods was when I was writing it, it was really just me, uh, like, you know, I learned like in this process of uh, these last this last year year and a half uh, you know I got out of corporate and I saw the God in me um, when I was in corporate you know but at the same time it's like I was in the future I was seeing myself in the future I had to understand who I was first to get there 
Um, and so I think the most important thing of what people call God is knowing the God in you, knowing who you are, knowing the power that you have within yourself, learning yourself, uh, knowing where you came from, understanding your lineage, understand where you're going in the future, understand the power of generational wealth. It's not just to say that, oh, I got a lot of money. It's to bring our culture back <coughs> to where we need to be, you know, back to where we were in the first place. Um, and we have that power um, within us, but you have to know who you are first. Like they say in the, the pyramids and in ancient chemists, you know, before you, you cannot enter into the pyramid if you do not know thyself. So I think that's the most powerful thing. Um, I think that, you know, because like I, you know, I don't really want to talk about my beliefs, but I don't believe in God, but I believe in where I came from. I believe in the power of, you know, my mother, you know, giving birth to me, you know, and the sacrifices that she made to make sure that I was here and the, like going back to, you know, I think this is just a beautiful way to wrap it up. The thought that she had, you know, the vision that she had uh, for, even though she wasn't going to be here with me physically, she saw me before I even got here. Um, and so that's powerful. And so me paying homage to her is me paying homage to myself and paying homage to my roots and and still moving forward for when I do have kids and making sure that they have a great life and that they have a mind of their own. I don't want them to submit to my thoughts, you know. I want them to have a mind of their own but to continue their legacy for eternity. Um so I think that what what slave the gods is really saying is like yo like don't limit yourself. Know yourself. Yes. So thank you so much for that powerful message to leave us with. Now, Don, um, tell us where we can find you, what's your social media, your website, et cetera, et cetera. So these people can go ahead and buy these powerful books from you. Right. So um, my business page is the acronym for No More Suits, North Carolina. So that's N-M-S-N-C. Um, and again, that's No More Suits. North Carolina, so it's literally the acronym for that. Um, and I just changed my personal IG to Don Rahim underscore. So um, <laughs> that's my personal Instagram is Don Rahim underscore. So you can find me at Don Rahim underscore, and it's gonna say God sent from my iPhone. So that's me. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, thank and you. for. Thank you. For everybody that is listening, please, please go out and buy these books. Let's yeah. support black businesses. Yeah. The alarm clock is absolutely amazing. I was literally agreeing to everything that he was talking about in the book. So please go out and purchase these books. What is your website? No more suits, LLC.com. And we just released a uh, uh, new uh, clothing line, the Page Street, which is literally Page Street from Book of Rhymes. I'm wearing it right now. Um, and we're going to have a package, uh, the Book of Rhymes package. Uh, the one-year package was going to include a copy of Book of Rhymes and a T-shirt. Um, so if you go on my website, you could check that out. We have a lot of great things on the website. We got a lot of content on there. We have a lot of products on there. You can get my books on there. Um, you can subscribe to our customer list where we will let you know about upcoming events we'll let you know about new releases um we have carolina panther tickets on there go panthers you know what i'm saying so uh go to no more suits you you, you will um find a lot of great stuff on there yeah thank you happy hill <laughs> thank <laughs> you salute there. the happy hill <laughs> salute the liberia peace and love yes Hotel. yes all right well we will see you guys next time thank you so much for tuning in thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.